Um, good morning, everybody. Welcome to Arise Church. If you are, I see some new faces again. Uh, thanks for choosing to come and worship with us. And uh, those who came recently and came back, I'm glad we didn't scare you away. That's exciting. Um, so we're going to do things a little bit different this morning. We uh, are very blessed to be able to baptize Christian this morning. Uh, and so we're going to do that. We wanted to do it at the front of the service because we want the kids to be able to witness uh, and so I'm going to, if Christian's around somewhere, I'm going to have Christian come and just share a few words. He's up there. We're good. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make my way back there with him. Uh, Christian's going to share a few words about what God's been doing in his life. And then I'm going to invite the kids to come up and, and be up close while this happens. So. Come on down. It's warm enough you won't freeze in there. Cool. Um, well, it's just a bit about my story. Um, it's not super unique in many ways. I grew up in a Christian home. I was going to church, and I would have considered myself a Christian for most of my life. Um, but as I got older, I fell for the age-old lie that I was smart enough to know what was best for me, and I didn't need a faith or a God really to tell me how to live my life. Um, Despite this, though, I never walked very far away from Christianity or my faith. Um, I continued to go to church, partly because that was easier than telling my family I wasn't interested in going, um, but mostly because I had this nagging discomfort in the back of my head and these nagging questions in the back of my head about God, my faith, its role in my life, and what direction I was taking my life in. Um, so, fast forward a few years, and I continued to kind of seek out answers to these questions from people I considered to be strong Christians, and they gave me really good, honest, truthful answers, but what I've come to discover in recent years is that I was not approaching those conversations with an open heart or an open mind or really, really willing to hear their answers. Um, so... About two years ago, I had kind of personally come to a shift in that, and I was really facing those questions I had about, can God really love me, a broken person, um, even someone who had started to walk away from him? Um, what does it look like to be a Christian in a world that feels so broken and where no one seems to ever agree with anyone? Um, so I had really started to approach those questions with more of an open heart and mind. I had recognized that I wasn't allowing myself to listen to those answers. Um, and at that same time, I found out I was moving to Oregon. And because God is so amazing, he had basically orchestrated this whole community for me to live in here via a friend of a friend. Um, and so I got to move into a house with a bunch of these people over here, that really loud guy named Josh specifically. Um, and that was just a huge blessing. Um, I got to move in with this super strong Christian community, and I finally was living my life with an open heart and mind for God and willing to hear the answers he was presenting to me. And so I got to witness what it meant to be a young adult Christian in this world through an amazing community and see just the love that they live their everyday lives with and see the impact he had had on their lives and just what it meant to be a Christian in my current stage of life. Um, and so, I have my notes. Um, I just got to really observe and watch them and I was embraced by them and got to have some really hard conversations, ones that I wasn't necessarily looking to have but I just found myself in um, and it challenged me and it was really good for me. And so through all that, I found the answers to my questions I realized I am loved. It's okay that I had doubts. Um, God has loved me. He's forgiven me. And it's all just a testament to his love, um, this community, and honestly, the whole universe. You look around you in his creation. It's all just a huge testament to his love that we live in this vast, powerful universe created by a powerful God, and he created this one special speck of rock for us to live on and, and worship him in. And so, 
For me, this baptism, it's not so much about saying at this moment, I am now a Christian. That happened long ago now. Um, it's about declaring my faith. I don't want to live it privately. I want to declare it to the community that I'm living in. Um, I want to declare it to my friends, to Scotty, to this whole church, um, so that I can be held accountable and so that I can have other people come alongside me and help me increase my prayer life, learn more about the word, and, and grow in my relationship with Jesus every day. So I think the last thing I'd just like to say is thank you, Scotty. Thank you to this whole crew right here, to this church for embracing me and for, whether you knew it or not, being a testament to God's love to me and to the world. Um, it has truly changed my life. Yeah, anyone think that's worth celebrating? <laughs> so I'm going to have you turn backwards. You want to have a little seat down here? Christian, I've got a couple of questions for you. First of all, do you believe Jesus died for your sins, rose from the dead, and is coming back for his bride? With all my heart. Do you confess that Jesus is both your Lord and your Savior? Yes. Are you committed to repenting from all your sin, submitting yourself to the authority of his word to do whatever God wants, whenever he wants it, whatever it costs? Yes. Well, based on that, it's my privilege to baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So hold your notes. I think put this hand right here. Ready? Here we go. Oh. Woohoo! That was easy, right? Let me give you that. So I'm going to make Christians stay here a little bit wet. Um, what I want to do, um, churches do this differently, but this man has just confessed something really important in his spiritual journey. And there are people here in the church who walk with them through this process. Uh, and so I want to give an opportunity for some of them. I ask them if there's a word of encouragement or a blessing that they'd like to pray over Christian at this important part of his life. And a few of them said they'd love to. Uh, so anyone that wants to from the crew, come on up and, uh, and speak your words. You going first, Cam? I guess. <laughs> Can I back here? Yeah. Um, whenever I first started dating Christian, I asked the father, what do you think of Christian? And I just thought it was a good idea to get his thoughts on the guy. And um, You're okay. It was one of the most profound moments I've had with the Lord. He tenderly and kindly, but with such firmness, told me, he's my son. And it was this beautiful moment that I just remember with such peace and such beauty. And that's what I want to pray over you um, as you walk into this new decision. Um, yeah, Christian and Father, I just pray that you would um, be reminded of how securely you're loved, um, how closely you're held and how the Holy Spirit is with you every day, every hour, every moment of your life from this moment forward. Um, I just pray that you would feel his peace wash over you in every second, um, and that his strength would make you stronger. I pray that the Father would be a friend to you like you've never known before, that he would be your closest confidant um, and your kindest friend. Um, I just pray that you would find him with you and beside you and in front of you. I pray that you would know that you are fully known um, and fully loved and fully accepted. Um, I thank you for um, your son, Father, and I thank you for his decision. I pray that we would all love him well um, and walk with him through this life in such peace and such joy because he gets to be friends with you and all of us. We love you. Hello, Christian. <laughs> um, yes, I, it's just an honor to know you, and um, it's, it's just such an honor to have watched you, like, come in. When you came into Oregon, you immediately reminded me of Jesus, um, carried a deep kindness um, that is quite rare, um, and so it's just been 
sweet to watch you open your heart to him and then to us as well. Um, and what I found too is that you're not someone that makes decisions or really does anything without um, like deep consideration and like a sureness. And so um, I just bless you in this decision today um, to live out your love for the Father in an open and, be, and like vulnerable way before others and before community and before him. Um, I just bless you in this as your heart is open um, to walk deeply with the Father all of your days um, for the rest of your life that you would become closer and closer to him in every moment. Um, yeah, I just bless you to watch him do it again. As he created this community for you, he's going to keep doing the exact same thing. So I just bless you um, to watch his creation unfold on your behalf um, as you walk this life. Everyone, this is my good friend Christian, and I'm so excited that he is going to follow the Lord his entire life. And Christian, you moved into our house saying, I want to know the Lord, and I, I've watched you over the last um, like year and a half say yes to that, and um, like in your own way, and in a way that is only genuine to you, to say yes to the Lord and to loving him to seeking him and to finding him. Um, and so I'm so proud of you for the decision that you have made and are making today. I'm really proud of you. Um, you're steadfast um, and you are wise in your words and in the way that you speak with people and love them. You are such a good man. And I honor you and I bless you as you continue to seek the Lord with all of your heart for the rest of your days. I bless you to know the Father, to know his heart deeply for you, um, and that he would be your guiding light. Um, yeah, I'm just so proud of you, and I love you very much, Christian. And I'll finish up. <laughs> it's been fun watching you this last year in particular, but the, the, the blessing that I want to pray over you is this, uh, that you would continue to find answers in Christ and that in that place you would walk into the mystery of where we can't have the answers and you'd find them there just as powerfully as in the solid conclusions. And then that he would use you and he has anointed you and he will continue to anoint you to be a man who walks in the world leading people to answers and leading them into a place of comfort in the mystery of Jesus. So may that mantle rest on you, and may we celebrate together all of the fruit that that's going to bring in your life. In Jesus' name, amen. You are dismissed. <laughs> so here's what I want to do, just as everyone transitions, let's take two minutes, turn to someone next to you, say you're glad they're here this morning, introduce yourself, and then we'll kick back off. Kids, you're welcome to head through to your class. Does this work? Oh, it is.
Oh, there we go. What I want to do with the rest of our time this morning, um, when you're rebuilding the church and trying to reestablish who we are, we don't ever want to take for granted that people understand what we've just done. So I want to take the rest of the time just to talk a little bit about baptism. What is it? Why do we do it? And, and here's, there, there's a few groups of people in the room. So there's people in the room uh, that don't know Jesus. Uh, and so this is one of the parts of the evidence that you add to, to uh, your arsenal about walking into wholeness in him. There's people in the room who have been walking with Jesus who aren't baptized, and hopefully this is going to help you make a decision about taking a step of obedience to Jesus. And then there's lots of people in the room who are baptized, and there's an invitation in baptism to reflect on the commitment that you've made and to look at your own life and say, am I living effectively the commitment that I've made? So that's what we're going to look at in brief this morning. Um, I remember, uh, I don't even remember, I was 18, it was a long time ago, 20-ish years ago, something like that. Um, I was in a swimming pool in this Christian trailer park, um, at the, and we'd had this event, it was called Hurricane, it was this evangelistic outreach in my hometown, and I come from a small hometown, so there's like 30,000 people or something in the whole metro area of this town. Everyone knows everyone, my mom was in the newspaper every week, so tiny little town, um, and I'd been asked to come to this evangelistic outreach and so there was a big BBC music event happening down by, I live on the coast, down by the beach and so they decided we're going to go and we're going to do like uh, prayer and worship and preaching and testimonies and sharing the gospel with people at this event and so I didn't really know what I was doing at that point in my faith so I said yes because some friends were going and I thought it would be interesting so here I am this event has been going on where this evening every night we'd be staying in this trailer park at night we'd all go to this public pool and everyone is swimming and I'm with my best friend Stuart and he's at the side you know when you're at the side of the pool and you kind of hang on like this at the side so he's hanging on like this at the side of the pool, and I'm standing here talking to him, and he looks at me and goes, looks like you're about to baptize me. And I was like, that's cool. He's like, I really want to be baptized. I was like, you want to do it right here? I was like, I've not been baptized. Maybe we should get baptized right here. So we're like, let's get baptized. It didn't happen. He decided he wanted his parents there. Uh, the people that were running the event were like, oh, you can't get baptized. We don't do baptisms. Do it in a church, whatever. And I'm like, no, I really think God wants me to get baptized. So the next day, we're out on the streets. We're praying for people. We're sharing the gospel. We get into the pool that night, and I've had these conversations with people all day. I really want to get baptized. Like, I don't, have, I don't go to a church. Like, I don't have a church that I can get baptized in. I don't know a church to go to. Um, would you please baptize me? And so we're in that pool that night, and we're playing around, and I walk up to this gal, Connie, who was from Canada, and she was crazy. And uh, I walk over to Connie, and I'm like, Connie, would you please baptize me? Like, I really feel like you're all about, can you hear from God? and teach us to listen to God, I feel like God is saying, get baptized. Uh, and, and so I really feel I need to get baptized. And she said, okay, I'll tell you what. If you're willing to stand up on the side of the pool, get the attention of everybody in here, explain what you're about to do and why, I'll baptize you. So I stood up on the side of the pool. I got everyone's attention. At 18 years old, I didn't really know what I was talking about, but I told them my best attempt at what I was going to do and why. I got in the water Connie asked me some questions. She baptized me. And I just remember coming up out of the water. Sorry, Christian, yours isn't as cool as mine. I came up out of the water, and all of the friends that were part of this thing were in a big circle around about me, and they just all went like that with the water. So it was this just big fountain of water landing on me as I came up out of the water. And then they all started singing and swimming pool acoustics and five-part harmony, and it was just glorious. So, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Maybe if Ruben had been here. Um, but it was a significant moment. And for me, I had been born in a, a Church of Scotland household. It was Presbyterian. It was nominal Christianity. Uh, I'd been sprinkled as a baby. Uh, so I'd always been told, you know, you're a Christian. Didn't really, like, we went to church a little bit when I was young. But at this point in my life, I had, like, I had rejected Jesus. He'd slowly wooed me back. I'd been trying to figure out what was going on. And internally was this compelling, like, this thing happened when I was young. But I had no say in it at that moment. I didn't choose to follow Jesus. My parents made a commitment to give me to the Lord. And so at this point, as God is stirring in me, I wanted to be baptized and give my life to him and make it public to the community around me and to the strangers in the swimming pool, who I look at as a great moment. They were probably really annoyed to have their swimming interrupted by some idiot um, doing some Jesus stuff in the middle. 
But it was a powerful moment, and it shaped how I view baptism, and it shapes what ends up happening here as we lean into baptism together. So with that story, I want to I explain a little bit of what baptism is and invite us into some reflection here. So I want to start with this definition. Um, slightly different to what you're used to, we've been using this language around here quite a bit. Baptism is a prophetic act by which we publicly pledge our life to Jesus, committing to doing whatever God wants, whenever he wants it, whatever it costs. I feel like uh, there's been some church history movements, we're not going to talk through it all, but there's been some reactionary stuff in church history, and one of those reactionary pieces is we've settled on the language that baptism is a symbol an outward symbol of an inward reality. And I don't think it gets at the fullness of baptism. So baptism is, first of all, an outward sign, but baptism is a prophetic act. What Christian did there changed things in the spiritual arena. He didn't just make a declaration, get wet and come up. Spiritually, transformation happened in his life, and the kingdom of God is different as a result of the commitment that he just made. So I want us to understand that baptism is not just a sign pointing to something, but it's a prophetic declaration of a different reality moving forward. And it's the commitment to do whatever God wants, whenever he wants it, whatever it costs. So I want to look at six, again, this is going to be brief flying through. I want to look at six statements from Scripture that explain to us what baptism is. And each one of them is an invitation to self-examine where you're at in this stage of the journey. So the first reason that we get baptized is simple. It was modeled by Jesus. Um, we, We take meaningful things in Christianity and we turn them into simple, trite phrases. One of those phrases is follow Jesus, right? I follow Jesus. And we sing songs about it. But the call of us as believers is to follow Jesus. And what does that mean? It means that we imitate his way of life, his attitude, his behaviors. We're called to copy the things that he did. So the first reason baptism is really important and the reason it's the first step of obedience as a believer is we are imitating Jesus in the work that he did. Um, I've got a scripture up here from Jesus' baptism. Um, Matthew, the first gospel in the New Testament, chapter 3, says Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and yet you come to me. Jesus said, let it be so for now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill all righteousness. This is, this, these next three words are, are my, some of my favorite words in the whole Bible. Then John consented. John didn't understand, didn't make sense, didn't think it should happen, but when Jesus presented him with the challenge, his response was consent. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw the spirit of God descending like a dove and landing on him and a voice from heaven said, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. It's helpful to remember that the New Testament is a continuation of the Old Testament. The Old Testament tells us the story of the people of Israel. Uh, If you're reading the book of Leviticus, uh, there's a whole bunch of elaborate explanations in there of baptism ritual. When they set up the temple, there was a giant bath and priests, when they were going in and out of the temple, had to get into this water to wash themselves to remove the impurity that they were receiving from the sins of the people. Or when they were out in the world and interacting with unclean people, lepers and people with diseases and uh, and broken uh, people out in the world, they would come in and they would have to wash all of that off as a symbol of their purity walking in uh, to the temple. And so when Jesus is here, John has adapted this baptism that they did, this ritual washing, and he's been uh, convicted by God to, to prepare people for Jesus' coming by baptizing them in repentance, washing away all their sin in preparation for the reception of the Messiah. So when Jesus walks up and John's like, hey, you shouldn't do this, you've got no sin to have to be washed of. You've done nothing wrong to have to repent of. And Jesus says, no, this is the right thing to do. I want to fulfill. Who was Jesus? He was the high priest coming uh, to be our mediator. He was the sacrifice that was offered for our sins. So he's like, no, I need to go through the temple ritual of cleansing, ready for my role as high priest and ready for my job as sacrifice. And so Jesus walked in obedience to the Lord, even although it didn't really, in some sense, make sense, right? 
So for some of us, baptism, you're like, I don't know if this makes sense at this point in my journey. Sometimes it's just a response to the Lord to walk in obedience because Jesus did it and we're called to imitate his example. So that's number one. Number two, uh, it was clearly commanded by Jesus. So part of following Jesus is uh, obeying the things that he taught, right? We know this. This is 101. I'm hoping you're tracking. Um, part of following Jesus is to obey his teachings. And he clearly commanded this happen. Famous verse at the end of Matthew 28 called the Great Commission simply says, Jesus comes to his disciples and says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. So Jesus just died, he's raised from the dead, he's been given all the authority of heaven and earth, and he gives some instructions to his followers. With all this authority, go make disciples of all nations, baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teach them to obey everything I've commanded you, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. So this is a command that was given to the early disciples, like they... Go out into the world, make disciples and baptize. It's a command that continues to us today. Go out into the world, make disciples and baptize. The reflection question here is, how well are you doing in this part of the Great Commission? How many people whose names can you list who you've had the privilege of leading to Jesus and help shepherd them through baptism? That's a scary question sometimes because the list is a lot shorter than we want it to be, right? Um, we've talked about this before with all of the things in scripture there's an individual dimension and there's a corporate dimension so this is a command to the disciples corporately and it's a command to the church to be making disciples but it's also a command to us individually as disciples as part of that community where is our heart and the process of walking with people to the point of evangelism and baptism and then walking with them from there to be everything that I've commanded so he modeled it, he commanded it. The third reason for baptism, it's an act of repentance. I said this already, when, John, when Jesus got baptized with John's baptism, he was engaging in a baptism of repentance. What does repentance mean? The, the literal definition is to change your mind or to turn around your thinking. So repentance is really a turning from one way of living to another way of doing things. It's to say, this is how I lived before, dependent on self. I'm now going to live my life dependent on Jesus. I lived before using pop stars and soap opera icons and movie stars to be the guidance for how I live my life. Now I choose to reject that and follow Jesus' example. Repentance is about a change of heart and a change of act. So when Christian is up here today, he's already been on the journey with Jesus. His baptism was a declaration that that old way of living is gone. And he's publicly stating to us that he is now going to walk in repentance to the, ways of, uh, to the ways of the world and follow the way of Jesus. So what does that mean for us as a church? It means he's just given you permission when you see his life not reflecting Jesus to lovingly challenge that and invite him back into the way of Jesus. Scary, right? Uh, the closer you are to him in his circle, the more responsibility you have to be that voice of challenge and confrontation. And that's true for all of us. If you're here and you've been baptized, you have said, I have chosen to reject the way of the world to give my life to the following of Jesus. So think about your life today. How much of it looks like Jesus and how much of it is still following the way of the world? I want to think about the community that you live in, uh, the, the people that you do Christianity with. How much permission, verbal permission, have you given them to look at your life and confront the brokenness and call you back to repentance? Uh, how confident are you with the people that you walk with in church and in life? Are you willing to step up and confront the brokenness in love when you see it? And are we willing to receive it when it happens and do something about it? Baptism is an act of repentance. But we do it at the beginning, and quite often we think the repentance part is done. Now I just get to live my life the way I want. Every time we watch someone get baptized, it's another invitation to reflect on how well we're doing at repenting on the things that we've, we've walked away from. Acts chapter 2, Peter is preaching 
uh, his first sermon post-Pentecost and his instruction, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. This tying together of repentance and baptism, that's why here in this church we practice believer's baptism. So we don't baptize kids because they can't make a confession of faith. We dedicate kids to the Lord together and we commit with one another to help raise those kids in the faith. But when people reach the point where they can choose repentance from sin in order to follow Jesus, then they can obey this command to repent and be baptized. Number four, not just an act of repentance, it's an act of initiation. Like it or not, baptism brings you into the church. And it means that you cannot be a Christian apart from his church. And there's lots of issues with the church. The churches in the world are broken and messy. We get it wrong. We've just experienced two years of COVID where we found out that it's really easy to stay at home and sleep in on a Sunday and tune in to our favorite speakers like podcast instead of participation in the church community. Um, but we are called in baptism, it's initiation into the family of God. And so I, I said at the beginning, it's a prophetic act. One of the aspects of what happens when you go under the water and you're raised anew is you're initiated into this spiritual entity that spans history and spans geography. In the act of baptism, we join with billions and billions of Christians through the ages who have taken that step to publicly confess to people that they are a part of this entity called the church, the family of God, his bride whom he loves and was willing to give his life for in order to redeem her and make her spotless and blameless. So in the act of baptism, we make a commitment to this bride uh, to love and to cherish the church, to participate as parts of the body in building the church up. And with that, to, to live in a way that reflects Jesus to the world, to allow him to do that transformative work in us and in one another as we move out into the world. Paul in, in 1 Corinthians He's explaining that the church is a body of people. It's, it's like he uses the imagery of a human body with all of these parts together. And he says, just as a body, though one has many parts, all its parts form one body. So it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jew or Gentile, slave or free. And we were all given one spirit to drink. So this baptism moment is symbolic of our stepping in to this group of people called the church with all of our warts and messiness um, called to love and to serve and to bring transformation. Number five, the fifth reason that we get baptized, and this is the one that we talk the most about most often, is it's a picture of the transformation that we're called to walk in. If you've never seen a baptism before, what happens in that moment, the, the, the water is symbolic of the tomb of Jesus. And so when someone is being baptized, what they're doing is as they go down under the water, they're declaring that I have died to myself. I am dead just as Jesus was dead. And here I am in the tomb, dead with Jesus. And when they come up out of the water... It's a declaration that I have been resurrected with Christ. So now it's no longer me that lives, but it's Christ that lives in me. So I am now going to live differently as I walk in the world. And um, also with baptism, is the imagery, part of the picture of transformation, is the imagery that comes from the Old Testament of washing. It is going into the water, washing off all the death and the stench of death from living in a, in a world opposed to Jesus and coming up out of the water clean and, and symbolically washed anew. Our sins are gone and we're made new in Jesus. It is a symbol and a prophetic declaration of the spiritual transformation that took place. A Christian, in giving his life to Jesus, and then modeled and, and depicted to us in his baptism, has declared that Christian, as he was, is dead. And Christian, with Christ living in him, is now alive to live in the world. How are you doing on the transformation journey? Think back to when you first got baptized. Does your life look more like Jesus? 
Is there more repentance and washing of sin? Have you embraced the truth that the old self is dead, that those old things that you did wrong were paid for by Jesus and you don't need to feel shame and guilt over them anymore? Paul in Romans, talking about baptism, talking about transformation, he he says these words, what should we say then? He's talking about the grace that comes through Jesus, that transformation is free, it's a gift. And he says, what should we say then? Should we go on sinning so that grace can increase? Because if, if, if our sin means that we get grace, if we sin more, we get more grace, right? Should we go on sinning so that grace would increase? Not at all. We are those who died to sin, so how can we live in it any longer? Don't you know that all of us who are baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were therefore buried with him through baptism into death in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we too can live a new life. For if we've been united with him in death like this, we will certainly also be united with him in a resurrection like this. It is so easy to go through the act, the rite, the ritual of baptism and then live our life as if that was a done deal and it doesn't affect me anymore. And it's so easy, we're reflecting on it in pre-service prayer this morning, it grieves my heart when I look at my own life, how easy it is to resort back to just doing life myself without Jesus. Reuben calls last night or texts last night, hey, I'm ill, it's like, how do I fix this? And I'm panicking, I'm like, oh my goodness, there's no one to lead worship in the morning. I'm texting everyone, oh, can you lead worship, can you lead, I'm not going to lead worship, can you lead worship, can you lead worship? And I'm like, what benefit did that do to take it on myself to try and fix the problem rather than trusting him who had the answer all along, right? But that's the way we do our life. We, we so easily, we do the baptism thing and say, Jesus, I'm going to follow you wholeheartedly. I acknowledge that in this moment, somehow supernaturally, my life has been united with your life. So that scriptures that are true, that say things like we're seated with Jesus on the throne in the heavenlies are true right now. Somehow in the heavenly realm, Jesus is seated at the right hand of the Father. And through the work of the Spirit in our lives, we are seated with him in unity on the throne with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies available to us, right? And yet we live like, like it's all about me, right? <laughs> we, we live with this poverty and scarcity mindset that, that there's never going to be enough and it's never going to happen and God's never going to heal or fix or be present when he offers us all of these blessings. Our baptism is a picture of the transformation that happened and it, we're supposed to then live that out in the world, Uh, So how is your transformation process looking? And what ways do you still look like the world? And which ways do you look like Jesus? If someone was to look at your life uh, right now, if they look at all of the elements of your life, if they could put on a movie screen all the thoughts that have gone through your head in the last 24 hours, if they could watch a video of everything you did over the last 24 hours, does your life reflect the glory of God? Are there things in there that would bring you shame and bring him shame in the process? Uh, We've all got things that we're doing wrong. None of us are perfect, but we're in this process. Are we still committed to change or have we settled into Settled into our brokenness and settled into our sinfulness and just been willing to deal with the status quo rather than seek death of self and life in him. The final point here, which is the summary of all of this, baptism is an invitation to examine. And I've used the old word here, examine, which is a spiritual discipline of looking at your life to see where God is present or absent, to see where you feel him or don't, where you're at peace and where you're not. How are you growing and changing? As we watch a baptism every time and We're declaring over this church that we're going to see many baptisms in the future as we arise into the calling that he's given us. Every baptism is going to be an invitation for you to re-examine how you're doing and living out this commitment to do whatever God wants, whenever he wants it, whatever it costs. And it's an invitation to us corporately to look at and examine how are we doing as a church. You know, when the church is healthy, And living the way Jesus commands it, baptisms are a regular occurrence. Like we should, we should do something in the U.S. right now where we should send out an exam, like an examine form to every church, and just ask the question: How many baptisms happened in your church this year? The answer to that question alone will tell us the health of the church and the mission of God. 
Because if we're doing what God is calling us to do and living the way he's calling us to live, people are drawn to him in us. They can't help but hear the truth, fall on their knees before it, give their life to him, and go out into the world to do the same thing. Paul, in his letter to the Ephesians, shows us what this examination and transformation looks like. Ephesians 5 says, Be very careful then how you live, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. You think the days are, like, I always have these moments with Paul. I'm like, we look around, the days are evil. It's like, this is like 2,000 years ago, and Paul's like, the days are evil. So, uh, (laughs) it's still going on. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Spirit, speaking to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit. Sing and make music from your heart to the Lord. Always giving thanks to God the Father for everything in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I I put this in here. It doesn't have the word baptism, but all the way through Acts and and through Paul's letters, we see these moments where people were baptized in, in, in the water and then the Spirit of God would fall on them and they'd be baptized in the Spirit. And so here you've got this moment of transformation. Don't live the way you were living before in foolish, silly ways. The ways of the world, self-seeking, self-pleasure. Instead, be baptized and filled with the Spirit and walk in the life that he has for us. And what does that life look like? How does it manifest? Romans 5 will tell us that God poured his love into our hearts by his Spirit. And so love manifests in us. Galatians 5 is going to tell us that the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control are going to manifest in us. In this passage, what does it do? It affects what comes out of our mouth. We begin to speak to one another with psalms and hymns and songs from the Spirit, making music in our hearts, always giving thanks to the Lord. If you ever need a test to see how well you're doing at walking out your baptism commitment, and if you ever need a test to see whether or not you need Jesus or not, Spend 24 hours making the commitment to let nothing come out of your mouth that is untrue nor critical. So no negative or no false words come out of your mouth. Try for 24 hours. That means no exaggeration. It means no white lies. It means when someone asks you, does my bum look big in this? Right? And just see how helpless we are to control this tiny little thing in our mouth. And it shows us how much we need him to transform the inside of our life so that our tongue pours forth with words from the Spirit, with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. That's partly why in a moment like this in baptism, I want this to be a practice, right? Someone gets baptized, we're shedding the lies that the world has spoken over us. I want the first thing that we do is is as the people of God to speak words of the Spirit, psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Uh, So the first first infilling is words of truth and encouragement. So my encouragement will be when, when we finish the service, grab Christian. God may have put something on your heart to share with him this morning. Go encourage him, build him up, give him a hug. Speak words of scripture over him. Find your favorite words from a worship song and speak them over him. And let's declare over him the truth of God. And it's an invitation to do that with one another. It'd be interesting to just find a word from a psalm or a word from a song and find one person in the room today that you can speak that over as a symbol of walking out your baptism and the fullness of the Spirit speaking to one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. So two questions to frame and, and focus that invitation as we wrap up. So first one, for whom or what are you living? And I want you to really dig in because if, uh, if you say you're walking with Jesus, the reality is, there are some other things in your life that you're probably living for in this moment. And so you can say, Jesus, but also. Um, So for whom or what are you living? And today's an invitation to lay that down once again to him. And the second one, if you have given your life to Jesus and you have been baptized, how truly are you living the baptismal commitment to do whatever God wants, whenever he wants it, whatever the cost 
And what's the fruit that gives evidence that your answer is true? So we're going to uh, close and worship together. But what I'd like us to do is just, we, we did this a little bit last week. I'd love you just to group up with some people next to you and pray. Uh, pray an encouragement, a blessing over the people next to you. Pray for the strength and empowerment to live out the baptismal commitment. Um, and if you're here and you don't know Jesus and you're not walking in, in, a, in Christian faith, you can let them know and they will pray for your journey of seeking that God would provide you the answers that you're looking for. So let's take a couple of minutes and pray together um, before we close and worship.